Thank you, coach. <laughs> ready to play. Are we ready to play? Very good. I'm going to uh, move this mic so you can hear me better. And I'll remember not to move too much. And I have notes that I like to read from, so I'll stick with that and have our PowerPoint. How are we doing today? Doing well. Doing well. It is snowing outside, but we're talking baseball. <laughs> Aren't you excited? The baseball season is almost upon us. It's my favorite time of the year, better than Christmas, really. Um, and I tell a lot of people, I, I've been here in Kansas City now for, for close to 15 years, uh, but I grew up in the St. Louis area. And I am a diehard Cardinals fan, but I do cheer for the Royals, um, uh, except when the Cardinals come to town. And I'm always appreciative of folks because uh, the, the Royals fans are great. I enjoy going out to the games. And no one ever teases me about the 85 World Series. So uh, <laughs> we, leave, we leave that or those arguments uh, to the side. But we're very pleased to be here, and I appreciate everyone uh, involved with inviting me here. And we hope that you will enjoy the display that we have downstairs in the museum. Uh, of materials that we've, we've been able to gather from the museum, just a sampling of different items that we have at the museum, and of course, we're very pleased to be celebrating our anniversary, which we'll talk about. So greetings from the museum, uh, Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, a museum that is solely dedicated to preserving the history of African American baseball. Through photographs, artifacts, and multimedia displays, <laughs> thousands of visitors come to discover the greatness of the Negro Leagues. The living portion of this history survives in the collective memories of close to 150 veterans of the leagues located across North America, Mexico, and the Caribbean. And as I've mentioned, the museum is celebrating its 20th anniversary this year, founded in 1990. The museum began as a small grassroots organization dedicated to preserving important local and national history. It developed a very popular traveling exhibit in 1993 and then opened a temporary gallery space in 1994 before establishing a permanent facility in 1997, which you see the entrance to here. And visitors enter a modern old-fashioned baseball stadium and follow a timeline of black history and baseball history with hundreds of photographs. The timeline flows from the late 1800s through the 1960s, and visitors must uh, learn the history before entering the centerpiece exhibit, the Coors Field of Legends. The, f the field features life-size bronze sculptures of important players in Negro Leagues history. And usually when, the, especially young people come to the museum, as you work your way around, uh, we want you to, to have this, this warning, especially for the athletes here in the room. This is a mock baseball diamond, so don't get too excited when you get out there. If you start running around, the, the statues weigh 400 pounds a piece. So, if, if you run around and you're doing a lot of horseplay, you will run into one of the statues and you will be knocked out. <laughs> of course, since, uh, since, since you're here at the medical center, some of you may actually know what to do in the case of that situation. We prefer that you not, <laughs> we prefer that you not touch these statues and please don't try to talk to them either. <laughs> Although, uh, someone can tell me, um, uh, since we are at the medical center, uh, the phobia of statues. Anyone know what that is? I can't remember the exact word for that. But apparently it is a real phobia because I've had in my years at least two patients who were very proud to come to the museum but were definitely afraid to walk anywhere near this exhibit. <laughs> because there, there are 12 <coughs> statues all together in the exhibition. But uh, it, it's, it's quite an interesting place to be for someone like that. We focus on the Negro Leagues. But what were the Negro Leagues? Why were they so special? Are we elevating sports in association with history? And why do we even use this archaic term Negro to describe anything? Where might you, have you heard of references to the Negro Leagues? Could you have seen some of the interesting retail apparel uh, or gear, as the kids say, worn on the streets? Uh, the museum has helped to revive interest in Negro Leagues history by licensing products which feature logos and emblems of various teams. Uh, this product is worn by many celebrities and dignitaries as well. Uh, you might see uh, a Negro Leagues baseball jersey on someone like singer Alicia Keys, and I've seen uh, uh, hats and things on the most obscure entertainers like the Insane Clown Posse rap. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, the material is out there. But maybe you've seen references to the Negro Leagues in this way. 
perhaps it was a more contemporary reference that you may have noted in the film uh, that you watched with your family, uh, such as the animated feature Everyone's Hero, uh, or Are We There Yet, featuring rapper Ice Cube, where the lead character uh, uh, receives advice from a Negro League's baseball bobblehead dog on his dashboard. <laughs> uh, or perhaps uh, you noted a reference to Negro Leagues in one of your favorite television shows like Touched by an Angel or X-Files or Cold Kicks. Um, and others who uh, have uh, dedicated shows uh, completely to the history of the Negro Leagues. Speaking of television, you might even go back a little bit further uh, to the 1990s when Ken Burns came out with his film on baseball uh, in the 1990s, uh, which appeared on PBS, and showcased Negro Leagues history along with Major League Baseball history. Um, some of you may have caught the film Finding Buck McHenry, which was on Showtime, or Soul of the Game, which was on HBO. You might even be old enough, some of you, to have seen these, this team, the Indianapolis Clowns, uh, who performed around uh, Kansas City and other places in the 1950s. And if you are old enough, we thank you for being here. You probably look great for your age. So. <laughs> Now, I think it's safe to assume that uh, most of you may recognize this baseball player. This is Jackie Robinson, a young Jackie Robinson. Um, uh, for most discussions of black baseball history, he is the entry point for most people. This is, when we talk about black baseball, people know Jackie Robinson right away. However, Robinson is the climax of the story, maybe the middle of the story, if you will. Robinson stands on the shoulders of many baseball players who, who came before him. Men like Leroy Robert Page, better known as Satchel, considered among the greatest pitchers of all time. Then there is James Thomas Cool Papa Bell, uh, the fastest outfielder of his era. There's also Josh Gibson, uh, who some call the Black Babe Ruth, or as others have said, maybe Ruth was a white Josh Gibson. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because of his prodigious home runs that he hit as well. Now, Robinson's appearance in baseball history is the climax of a story which begins after the Civil War and ends with the start of the Civil Rights Movement, and we call that Negro Leagues Baseball. We define Negro Leagues Baseball as the highest level of professional baseball available to African Americans and Latino athletes from the late 1800s through to the 1960s. Uh, we continue to refer to them as the Negro Leagues, even though the descriptive Negro is fallen out of use, only to help explain the historical context of these times. Also, there were business structures named Negro National League or Eastern Colored League, uh, colored being another archaic term. Uh, but we only refer to such terms as they were used then. And within the study of the Negro Leagues, one can explore a number of important social studies themes, uh, including race relations, economics, gender roles, geography, and those that are listed there. Now, I feel that black baseball, like jazz, represent unique institutions built by African Americans who brokered their abilities against segregation and oppression. I often reflect on the words of scholar and civil rights leader W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, who over 100 years ago uh, spoke of double consciousness. It's a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness. One ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls. Two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideas in one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. For the African diaspora in, the, in America, this was never more prevalent when attempting to participate in uh, or adopt or ultimately shape cultural institutions such as the military, the government, and even baseball. Baseball has been a rich cultural and commercial phenomenon for an Afro-Atlantic culture in the Americas. I mean Afro-Atlantic, I mean where the diaspora came from Africa through slavery, through the Caribbean, uh, through Mexico, through these places. The Afro-Atlantic culture, uh, beginning in the late 19th century, reaching an apex with the professional Negro Leagues from around 1920 to 1960 and continuing today, although in much smaller participation, with individuals contributing to the history of the game. Baseball players were testing the waters of integration and witnessing firsthand the positives and negatives of the experience, much in the same way as black entertainers, black soldiers, Pullman car porters, and others who traveled the nation. 